Hi, my name is David Day. This program originally aired on February the 5th for the ICM community on abstract and pareidolia art. We had a few technical glitches during the recording of the program, so I want to thank David Newman for the opportunity to remaster this program so we could uh, get rid of uh, some of the glitches that occurred and make it a little smoother presentation. So today, as I said, we're going to talk about abstract and pareidolia art using studio ICM materials and techniques. Here are the topics we are going to discuss today. I'm going to give a brief introduction to ICM just in case we have any beginners in the audience who are wondering what ICM is. Then I'm going to talk about the equipment that I use in my studio work and how I set up my studios. Then I'm going to talk about scene creation and lighting consideration in the creation of the scenes that I photograph. I will talk quite extensively about camera movement and positioning, followed by post-processing and compositing. I will then give example images to reinforce specific techniques we discussed during the course of this presentation. If you are new to this form of photography, you may be asking, what is ICM anyhow? ICM is intentional camera movement during a long exposure, usually anywhere from one half to five seconds, at high f-stops to produce images containing distinct elements of flow and fluidity. Here are two really good examples. On the left, we have trees in my backyard. This was taken over a one half second exposure panning from the bottom up using the camera FV5 app on my Android cell phone. The images on the right are three images of plastic bags which were backlit with LED lights to create the illusion of trees at night. This is a tree triptych or a tree pareidolia that was done in the studio. That is the process that I specialize in. Because we have a lot of ground to cover today in this presentation, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about general ICM techniques. If you need additional information on ICM techniques that are typically employed in the field, please go to Stephanie Johnson's website at stephjohnphoto.com and click on the Education tab and you'll find a wealth of information there. As far as my studio ICM photography goes, I have created a number of YouTube videos and you can access any of those videos by using the, these links that are provided here. One of the things to remember about ICM is to expect more failures than successes whenever you're starting out. When I first started out in ICM, I took one image of a gob of wires in my workshop, and I was very fortunate to get a really interesting image out of that. So I raced back to the workshop, took an additional five images, came back, went to the computer, and got absolutely nothing. So I went back, took 10 more images, and got absolutely nothing. Then I went back and took 100 images, and out of those 100 images, I had maybe one or two that looked like something I might be uh, wanting to post on the Internet. So please expect more failures than successes in ICM, and don't give up too soon. I typically take about 500 shots to get two or three that I really like, and about 1,500 to 5,000 shots for every image that goes into my portfolio. Before we move forward, I want to give you a quick word of caution about ICM photography as it relates to the studio. Smooth and easy flowing camera movements do not always make for the best studio ICM images. Sometimes your camera movements can become almost violent to get the images that you're trying to make. In this process, you may experience some wrist damage from aggressive and repetitive camera movement. So if you start to feel some tingling in your fingers or your wrists as a consequence of this activity, please take a break and consider getting a wrist guard to avoid problems from repetitive camera movements. A few minutes ago, you may have heard a term that's new to you, and that is pareidolia. So what the heck is a pareidolia anyhow? Well, pareidolia is a derivative of two Greek terms, para meaning beside or beyond, and idios meaning image or appearance. 
it's the tendency of the human brain to try to make a reference to a past visual experience when we see something that we don't quite understand. As a consequence, a certain cloud formation in the sky may look like a rabbit, or a piece of burned toast may look like it has a picture of the Mother Mary inside it. That's what a pareidolia is. So that's about enough of the introduction on Studio ICM. So let's go live now and take a look at the processes that I use to create my images. Here is a good example, and it's one of my favorites. I call it bouncing a ball. Please remember this image because we're going to talk about several techniques related to it through, uh, throughout the course of this presentation. We'll start out with a discussion of my studio and how my studio is set up. This is the studio in its entirety. It's nothing more than a wooden framed box. It's four feet long, four feet high, and about two and a half feet deep. Right here I've got a little rack that's got a couple of uh, ropes going across it so I can dangle things from it. So if I'm going to do a wire ICM photograph, I can hook pieces of wire onto this frame, dangle them right in the middle of the box here, give them a side light maybe like this, and then I can shoot those, uh, make some photographs of these wires as we move forward. So we'll talk about this a little bit later. Let me get them up out of the way for right now. Anyhow, on the bottom of the box, I've got several different kinds of lights. The first kind of light that I want to show you, and the one that I really use a lot, are called Govee Hex Lights. And I, there's an app for these things, so I can turn them on right there with just a click of a button. And then I've got the ability to individually adjust each one of these Govee lights to the color, the brightness, uh, the hue that I want it to be, just by pressing on that light. So let's say I wanted to change these green ones right here, wanted to change them to red, I could do that. Now the app also has on it a nice little color wheel, so I've selected these two red lights here, and I might want to have that red not be so dramatic, so I can turn it back very, very quickly like that. And each one of these are individually controlled, and they're something that I spend a lot of time with whenever I'm setting up a scene. And it allows me to make very minute adjustments to a scene so that if I've got bright areas or hot spots, I can tone one individual Govi lamp down while leaving the others static so that I end up with a scene that doesn't have a lot of hot spots in it. Because as you know, in ICM and in post-processing, hot spots are really difficult to deal with. Now, in addition to that, there are times when I, I want a little bit more of a pinpoint light, and for that application, I have a couple of strips of LED lights in here, and I, of course, I can change these LED lights again to any color I want, just to, with the press of a button, so on and so forth. Now, you may have noticed in here there are places where there are gaps or dark spots that sometimes I want to fill. To fill those, I've got a third set of, fill in those areas, I've got a third set of lights, and they're nothing more than a bunch of LED lights that are covered with little plastic spheres. So I stuff those down into those dark areas, and then I've got another control box here to turn them on and off, and you can see right there I've filled those dark areas in. Now, whenever I'm making a photograph, or I'm making an ICM, I don't want to lay my tissue paper, my plastic bags and everything on top of these lights because I tend to pull them apart and they tend to get stuck and tangled together. So to keep these things separated, what I have here is a little box that's been made that's covered with Lexan and it's made to fit right into this two and a half foot space right here. So I can position that in just like that. Now what I'm going to do is build my scene on top of this, so I'm getting the scene backlit from the uh, lamps that are underneath. And the first thing that I want to do is I want to diffuse this a little bit. And I don't, I have a lot of hot spots in this right now. So for a diffuser, I have a white, opaque piece of plastic that I just lay on top. And you can see how that's diffused things out very, very nicely. I've still got some hot spots here that I want to deal with at some point in time, but it gives me a start. On top of that, I then start to layer pieces of plastic. 
And this is a piece of gray, semi-translucent plastic that comes out of a trash can liner. And I just took the trash can liner and cut it apart. And I can lay it in there, say, like that. Now, you may be wondering how I get the tree limbs for the pareidolias I create of trees. Well, one of the things that I tend to do with this plastic is not just lay it down here, but I will put crinkles in it like that. So when I photograph in a panning mode, these ridges or areas will tend to be uh, darker and they will look like tree limbs. If I wanted to lock that in place, I'll take just a sheet of glass that I took out of, out of an old picture frame and just lay that on top and that kind of like presses them down a little bit. So now I've got some really nice tree limbs leading up into an area that I might change to green to make uh, some foliage out of. Okay, on top of that, I then begin to construct the scene with my tissue papers and you can see I've positioning that so I'm getting rid of some hot spots there and maybe a little bit darker tissue over here to give it some uh, to give it some contrast and then as needed I'll come back in here with additional plastic bags to further diffuse this light and create the scene that I'm looking for or the beginnings of the scene that I'm looking for. Now one of the things that I'm working with now that I find really fascinating is newsprint. And this is a piece of newsprint, and newsprint has some very large letters on it that tend to create a lot of texture in the photos, and uh, of course the photographs in the newsprint itself, which tends to create more ambiguous areas in the photograph when you photograph them in ICM. So I've got a little bit of a hot spot over here yet, and I wanted to have uh, my photograph come down along this ridge of uh, dark plastic and lighter area right here, so I may pr position my newspaper as such. I want to get rid of that big dark area there. And that's basically how I put a scene together. From here, what I will do is I will go in and I will start to shoot this scene and I will continue to rearrange it as I see hot spots in the preview on my camera, on the viewfinder in my camera. And I will uh, continue to arrange it around and continue to use different techniques with ICM until I start to get the image that I want. And from there, I'll make incremental changes until I finally get to where I want to be and then take a lot of images of that photograph so I have have a lot of choices when I go to post-processing. Before we delve into the photographs or the ICMs with the tissue and the plastic bags and the newsprint, let's talk a little bit about the wire photography, which is where I got started. I've got a couple of wires up here on my suspension system and I'm going to pull them down here for a little bit. And we're going to arrange them like this. Now, one of the things that I would mention with wires is, first off, a few wires will do a really good job of creating an ICM photograph. It's uh, easy to get too many wires in here and then you get just a jumbled up image. If I wanted to, I could add a little bit of a tissue to it, a little bit of tissue paper to this for a little bit of extra, extra image uh, interest. And to do that, I've got a little glue stick here that I'll apply to a little piece of a tissue paper. And then I'll take it and I'll fix it somewhere in here. Okay. Now, one of the things that people ask me about with all these photographs is, David, how do you get all the uh, vibrant colors in them? Well, I'm not doing a whole heck of a lot of adjustment in Photoshop. The vibrant colors are just a consequence of shooting in a darkened, uh, in a darkened studio. And for purposes of darkening and keeping out the stray light, I have this black cloth all surrounding the box that I have created. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but I've got a window over here and I've got that uh, covered with a black cloth as well. Okay, so I have my wires in here. And the first thing that I want to get rid of is all of this down here because that will tend to uh, filter into the scene and pollute the scene. So I'm going to turn the govies off. I'm going to turn the LEDs off. And I'm going to turn the filler lights off. Okay, so now everything is off. Then I want to position this lamp here with the snoot on it. So it's not really illuminating the whole scene, but so it's glancing the 
tissue paper in the wire and I want to have the tissue paper arranged so that I've got highlighted areas that are direct highlighted areas and areas that uh, the light is shining through uh, the tissue paper and once I get that together and I get it appropriately lit so I've got a con I've got a combination of lights and shadows I'll start to take some test photographs usually with a little bit of rotation like that and I will continue to do this until I get something that's really interesting. If I don't like uh, what I'm getting, I will re rearrange the, t the wires just a little bit. And I would like to tell you right here that uh, when you rearrange these wires, do this incrementally. That was actually a lot of change right there. But uh, it's amazing how just an incremental change can create such a dramatic change in the uh, final photograph. So I will, once I find something that I like, which is right there, I will try to repeat that movement, staying within one plane here so that I get a good focus area. And a lot of it's not out of focus and continue to shoot until I get it to where I want it to be. Okay, now let's start shooting with the tissue and plastic bags. So to get ready for this, the first thing I'm going to do is get these wires out of the way. One of the things that I've got to do one of these days is explore both the wires and the tissue together. I just haven't gotten around to that yet. I will turn this light off right here, get it out of the way, reactivate the Govi hex lights, and turn on my little LED lights, and finally, with this controller right here, I will turn on my filler lights so that I've got those in there, although they're not doing a whole heck of a lot right now, except creating a couple little blue areas. The first thing I want to look at when I get into this, and I'm going to photograph up through here, are many any hotspot areas that may be occurring. And if I've got some hotspot areas, I may uh, arrange my tissues or my plastic bags a little bit to get rid of those hotspot areas. I want to create some definition in this plastic bag right here. And if I want to, let's see, get some newsprint in here, I might uh, put the newsprint a little bit more on top of that. And when I get it to where I want it to be, I'll begin to take some test shots with it using a variety of different techniques that we're going to talk about here. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Oh, there we go with something. I want to move it up here. And I will continue to take shots using different uh, motion techniques that we're going to talk about in a second until I get somewhere where I want to be. And then I'll start to make some really incremental and fine tuning changes to get to my final image. Now, like field photography, you're going to, you know, want to do some panning. That's definitely uh, something that uh, is very, very beneficial here at times. The typical stretching out of the trees type images or type uh, technique that you would use out in the field. And also the circular technique tends to work well at times. And I've got a little bit of a highlight right here that might be problematic. And I wanted to add a little bit more, let's see, definition over here. So I'm going to change that around a little bit. Now, it's important when you're doing this to keep within one plane as you rotate your camera around or move your camera around. That way you get uh, focus front to back. Although that doesn't mean you have to do that all the time. Sometimes I will use a technique like this where I'm rotating and pulling out at the same time and that gives me some sharpened highlighted areas against a more diffuse background. But for the most part I try to keep within one plane when I'm taking these uh, photographs. Now, with ICM in the field, we're, we get very used to, you know, doing one continual smooth camera movement from start to finish. But with the studio technique, one of the things that I've found is that stopping and going at intermittent speeds, uh, maybe slow phase followed by a fast phase can give me some really interesting results. So I don't think about moving the camera at one speed throughout that uh, image, throughout that photograph. I will actually move it at different speeds at different points in time and that adds to the image quite a bit. So stop and go at intermittent speeds 
is one of the things that you want to remember. Close to far we covered, and one of the things that I like to do in here, and I'm going to adjust this just a little bit for that because I want this area to show now a little bit more up through here is snapping. I'll make sure I'm starting at this end of the sensor and go snap, snap, and I end up with something that's uh, replicated. Snap, snap, snap. And you can see there I've got a couple of images uh, as a consequence of that snapping that's occurring. Now we talked a little bit earlier on about uh, the creation of uh, fuzzy type hair and that's done as a consequence of just shaking the camera and I'm going to turn it on its side here and I got a little bit up there in the corner and I'm going to shake it like this and that's creating a nice bit of that fuzzy diffusion that I'm looking for there. And if I, oh, that's gorgeous there. And I've got a lot of uh, nice fuzz over there. So this is one of those times when I get something that looks pretty good. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep repeating that photograph until I get it right where I want it. Maybe make a little bit of an adjustment there and with a lot of shaking going on, a whole lot of shaking going on here. And I finally get something that, which is uh, something that I really want to process out. Now, it's important too, to not continually move in one direction and to think about changing your direction on these because what you're doing here is, look at that, I managed to get one that was totally uh, blue as a consequence of just changing the direction. But when you change the direction, these things overlap differently on the sensor. And although you're photographing the same scene, you can get a quite a dramatic difference in the result. So remember to take uh, completely change directions from time to time. Now we'll talk about the one that is the real wrist killer, the sudden directional changes. We can do stuff like that and uh, we'll end up with some really interesting photographs as a result. But these are the ones that can really, really kill your wrist if you're not careful. So be very, very careful with those. Another thing that I've learned is we're tending to photograph this within this box here, but I think you can see this down below. I don't have the bottom of my window covered and there's some light coming in through there. I have found that if you take these photographs and then move out of the scene, that sometimes you can end up getting some things that you really, really didn't anticipate in that photograph. So don't think that you've got to stay in this box. Uh, you can move outside of this box too. Uh, you want to definitely shoot overhead as well as what I call shooting the angles. And this is where some of the really, really interesting photographs can occur. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this scene now a little bit. So I've got something like this, where I've got a little bit of uh, the view from underneath. And then I'm going to get way down on my image and I'm going to start to photograph right in here. And this is what I call shooting the edges. And sometimes I get some very, very dramatic photographs as a consequence of shooting just down here in the edges. Now there's something else that we can incorporate in here. I think you can see that at the edge of the frame. And this is pieces of glass. And I'm going to show you a couple of images here a little bit later and I'm going to put that in there. And if you get a piece of glass, uh, in this case a glass vase, uh, situated just right, the light will come up through that vase and it will uh, diffuse quite nicely and give a very, very, fo very, very sharp edge right here with the uh, vase. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to come in and I'm going to rotate around that in hopes of creating something that catches that light. And I might do it off to the side of the vase a little bit and uh, continue to experiment with that. If it's not working out really well, uh, you can reposition that vase and uh, small repositioning will create a dramatic change in the way the light is coming up through here. 
maybe just do a, there we go, a little bit of a circular motion, and we see that the, we've got the outline of that vase right there as a consequence of doing that circular motion, and I've got this diffuse area out here at the edge where the camera is not focused. So I've got vases, I've got bottles, uh, one of my favorite ones is just this little glass jar right here and uh, you can just experiment with all sorts of glass in here and that is uh, something that I really like to do. Now there again, you know, if you don't get what you want, you can move this image around a little bit. I love this right down here, so I'm going to shoot that edge right there and you see I got a really really interesting beginning of an image right there and if I see something that I like again I will make very incremental changes in this whole process till I get to where I want that I'll shoot 50 to 100 photographs of that area to achieve to get some get some get the opportunity to select amongst multiple images for the final image that I'm trying to make well, we certainly covered a lot of ground in the live portion of this presentation. We've given quite a few different examples of the various studio techniques that I use. So now let's take a look at how they translate into actual images whenever we're finished with a photographic session in using studio ICM techniques. One of the first techniques that we talked about is smooth and continuous speed movement of the camera whenever making an ICM photograph. This is very similar to the ICM that is usually used in traditional ICM photography out in the field. This is a combination of tissue papers and it's a one second rotation in indirect sunlight. I made a smooth rotation trying to keep the lens continually focused on the center of the image so that I could keep that area in focus while I was surrounding the area with blur. A lot of people tell me that this one looks like a very unusual eyeball. We talked a little bit about wires and plants and side lighting of wires and plants to get some really interesting photographs. The photograph on the left is one single blue wire with side lighting to create highlighted areas and shadowed areas and that is what created the interesting pattern that you see there. On the right, we have a collard green that I photographed last year, and I made the rotation so that it was toward the bottom of the leaf. And as a consequence of that and the folding of the leaf, I caught the leaf both with a frontal reflection and a transmission of light through the leaf, and that is what created this unusual combination here. So side lighting can give some very dramatic impact if you're looking at uh, things like wire, and leaves that are suspended in your studio. Here we have a really good example of the stop and go techniques that I discussed. This is one of my favorite images and I call it the punishment of Sisyphus. I don't know how many of you are aware of uh, Greek mythology, but there was a god named Sisyphus who created some problems with the other gods that were above him. And as a consequence, they sentenced him to eternity of rolling a stone up a mountain. And as a consequence of this stop and go technique, I ended up with this image that reminds me of that mythological uh, story. And this was a rapid but small pop to the left halfway through the exposure with a full stop, and that was followed by a rapid pop left, and that resulted in the nice light trails that you see on the image, which are the uh, circular glass jar just to the right center of the image. And then there is the technique of snapping. This image is a really interesting one because what it shows is that you don't need to have a very complex setup to get something interesting. This was a single plastic bag that had a couple of folds in it, and it was that gray translucent bag that I showed you earlier that was backlit with a couple of different LED lights that were diffused by the uh, diffusion mechanism that I showed you earlier. And literally all I did was make two quick snaps to the left over a one and a half second exposure on this single sheet of folded plastic. And this created the triplicate of images that you see here. I saw call this three amigos. 
and uh, they seem to be rather rotund, happy individuals, and that is what came out of this one. It's a really nice image, a very easy one to create with the snapping technique. During the live presentation, we talked about plastic bags stuffed into ring lights, and this is a real good example of that technique. What I did was take a gray translucent bag and stuff it into the ring light and fold it so that none of the LED lights were exposed directly to the camera and that uh, avoided pinpoint lighting that uh, sometimes doesn't work so well in these ICM photographs. Then I did a camera rotation keeping the lens uh, right in line with the center of the image. So we get a center of image which is in really good focus with a periphery that tends to be a little bit more out of focus. Doesn't this look just like a packaging for a Christmas tree ornament? I really like it. Remember that image I called bouncing a ball a few slides back? Well, this bouncing a ball and the tree pareidolia I show here are two really good examples of shaking. Let's focus right now on the tree. The tree is a combination of two green and three blue GoV hex lights under a partially folded plastic bag held in place with an overlay sheet of glass. Note how the minute shaking as I moved up on this photograph created the impression of texture in the leaves. It's very similar to the texture that I got in the bouncing of a ball photograph that uh, on the upper right, left, left hand corner that looks almost like uh, fuzzy hair. So shaking can give you some really, really good texture results if you do it right. Sudden directional changes can be really interesting when it comes to ICM photography. But be aware, these are the types of motions that can create the risk problems that we talked about earlier. What we have here is a glass vase and plastic bags. The camera was moved from horizontal to vertical with a quick pop and movement down. As a consequence of this, I have two areas where the vase is very, very well defined. And in between those two areas, I have a stretched out area of red and orange that looks just like something that's inflamed. I call this photograph tendinitis. Panning and shaking is one of those combinations of techniques that can give some really unusual definition to your photograph. Here is one that I took of some backlit plastic bags. They were uh, backlit with several different colors of LED lights, and this is what came out of it. Although you get the uh, movement, you also get a lot of texture and a lot of focus area as a consequence of combining these two, two techniques. Now take this photograph and rotate it 90 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise. I sent this one out and uh, had a t-shirt made out of it. It's really a great looking shirt. So uh, don't forget that opportunity with ICM images as well. They do sometimes make some really, really good wearable art. Newsprint is something that I have recently started to incorporate into my ICM photographs. This is an image I call Dancing the Night Away. It was made by shaking during a vertical upward movement, followed by a twist to the right with shaking. Now there are several things to notice in this photograph. It looks almost like an elderly woman that's dancing at night and uh, she has white hair and as a consequence of that shaking we did get that fuzzy effect that fuzzy texture effect and there's a little bit of newsprint in there as well if you look closely but also look down into her skirt right behind her arm you can see something that you just can't quite make out and that was uh, one of the banners from one of the pages of a piece of newsprint and I think that that ambiguity that's generated or inserted into the photographs with the newsprint adds a whole heck of a lot to the image. So this is something that I'm going to continue to explore for a while. Here is another newsprint image that I call Celebration. It is a triptych of three images overlaid on a fourth image in the background that was also comprised of newsprint and plastic bags. 
This image was turned to monochrome after I made it, and it is an artist proof or a concept print that I am thinking, contemplating putting into a show that is going to take place later this year. There's something else that I wanted to mention about this image, and it may become a topic uh, that will stand on its own in a future presentation, and that is one of printing. Printing is really interesting when it comes to ICM images, and paper selection makes a whole heck of a lot of difference. Although this printed well on regular semi-gloss paper, whenever I printed it on the Red River silver metallic polar white paper, it really popped. What happens is with uh, the silver based papers is when light hits it at a certain angle, all of a sudden that white area just stands out and it's almost three dimensional. So it's something that you may want to consider if you are printing your ICM images. And then there's just the plain gross images. Uh, on ICM Artists on Facebook one day, we were uh, having some fun and we were talking about the unusual different things that we'd taken photographs of. And finally, somebody commented that I had not yet taken anything of a raw liver. And that got me to thinking, maybe I need to take a photograph of a raw liver. So I went out to the store, bought myself a pound and a half of raw beef liver, surrounded it with tissue paper and plastic bags, then backlit the whole thing, and I side lit it a little bit so I could get a little bit of lighting on the liver itself. And this is what came out. So we were having a lot of fun with it, but it was kind of gross, and it's something that I'm not definitely not going to repeat. Now, you remember earlier I said that I typically take about 500 photographs to get maybe one or two that I really like, and anywhere from 1,500 to 5,000 photographs to get one that's going into my portfolio. That leaves us with the question of, well, what the heck do you do with everything else? Well, I would encourage you not to get rid of it too quickly because sometimes these marginal images can turn into something that when layered on top of one another can create a very, very dramatic image. The image in the center is an image of the stones that are in the fireplace outside of my house. It's actually the chimney outside of my house that I made one day. It's an okay image, but it's uh, not something that I would consider putting in my portfolio. The image on the left is another image that is a combination of tissue paper and plastic bags or backlit. Although it's an interesting image, I do have a lot that look like it, and it's definitely not something that I would consider putting into my portfolio. However, when I took the image in the center and turned it into a negative, then overlaid it on the image on the left and did this under a hard light in the compositing option in Adobe Photoshop, I ended up with the image on the right. Doesn't this just look like you're looking through a shower curtain at a person about to step into a shower? Each of the images on the left and the center alone are not images that I would consider producing. However, the image on the right has turned into one of my favorites. So it just goes to show that sometimes the marginal images, when combined, can create a really dramatic photograph. Now let's move on to post-processing. Before we talk about my post-processing tools and techniques, I would like to remind everybody that there are endless ways in which post-processing can be achieved and that none are right or wrong, and they all reflect the individual artist's interpretation of their images. My post-processing tools include three software packages. The first is Adobe Lightroom, and that is where I do my rough editing of my photographs. Adobe Photoshop, where I do the fine-tuning of my photographs. And Topaz Denoise, where I denoise my photographs the only thing I want to mention about Topaz Denoise is, as a rule, a photograph should always be denoised before it is sharpened. If you do not denoise a photograph before you sharpen it, all you're going to be doing is sharpening the noise and bringing the noise out. There may be times when you want to do that, 
but as a general rule, I don't want to have to deal with the noise that is being introduced as a consequence of the ICM techniques. So I usually use the noise before I sharpen any of my photographs. During the course of today's presentation, I took a total of 71 images and I put them into Adobe Lightroom and I've been looking at them and I found one that I think might turn out pretty good. One of the things that I might mention is I like to underexpose my images a little bit to begin with because that uh, sometimes can save me from having to uh, try and fix images that have uh, blown out highlights. Anyhow, this image is what I'm going to work up right here and what I'm going to do to begin with is just add a little bit to exposure maybe change the contrast around a little bit. And I do like how that is uh, bleeding out into that area right there. And then I'm going to adjust my highlights a little bit. And in Lightroom, it's where I'm doing my rough edits. And it's right here that I can see if an image has potential to be further developed in Photoshop. Once I've decided it's something I want to develop in Photoshop, I will go ahead and edit in Photoshop, just port it right over to that application. And it'll take just a second for it to get into Photoshop. And we're still waiting. And here we go. And now it's in Photoshop. And the first thing I do when I'm in Photoshop is I take the image and I put it into Camera Raw Filter. You don't really have to do this, but I like Camera Raw Filter because uh, Camera Raw Filter has all of these different options all in one place, and it makes it very easy to adjust uh, a, an image as you're, as you're getting to the place where you're finalizing it. So now I'm going to maybe increase the exposure a little bit more and check out this really neat kind of fuzzy area here that was generated as a consequence of shaking as I was moving out in the uh, northeasterly direction. Okay, well, play a little bit with the contrast here and I like it a little bit with a little bit less contrast. I'll back off the highlights just a little bit and then I'll go down in here to effects and now in the effects I'm going to adjust the texture, the clarity of the image and you can see how that just changes it quite a bit and I'm going to put it right about there and I'm going to dehaze it. Now with dehazing, you've got to use that judiciously because it's very easy to get to a place where you're going to blow out a lot of the uh, image that is uh, just marginal. What I mean by that is let's take dehaze and let's maximize it. You can see, and that actually looks kind of neat, but I like it with all that area surrounding it, so I'm going to take that back a bit. Okay, so now I'm going to hit OK. I've got that where I want it. And the very first thing I'm going to do once I have the image in here is I'm going to go into the filter and I'm going to go to Topaz Denoise. Now Topaz Denoise is a third party software that you can attach to Photoshop. And I have done that. And it will take this image and it will export it to Denoise. And from here it will uh, look at one of four denoising options. And I've got this set up for the standard option right here. And I think you'll be able to see on my screen, this is the before over here, and you can notice some really fine grain in here. And it takes that and smooths it out. And it smooths it out without uh, getting rid of a lot of, the, uh, a, a lot of the features in the image. And that's because I've got enhanced sharpness set up to 76 here. But you can play around with it and do all sorts of different things in denoise. Once I have denoise where I want it to be, I will hit accept and it will process that image out. And it, this usually takes about 15, 16 seconds to occur, maybe just a little bit longer because this is a little more complex image. And once it's processed that out, it will transfer that image back to Photoshop where I can hopefully finish it off, off and have a good image that I want to add to my portfolio. Okay, now I've gone through the Topaz Denoise and the history up here. The next thing I want to do is maybe do some adjustments on this and the brightness and contrast. And I originally moved the brightness and the contrast down a little bit because I didn't want to blow out those uh, lighter areas. But now I can move it back up and you can see I'm getting a lot of definition, a lot of uh, really subtle coloring in this image right here, right now. And I'll do that. 
Sometimes I'll play with levels. I don't think I need to play with levels in this one. It's pretty much where I want. And I focus on this mid-range right here. And sometimes I'll move it up or down just a little bit if there's uh, some area out there at the edge of the uh, image that I want to get rid of. But I'm not going to do anything to this image because I like it right where it's at in terms of the levels. Now, to make this image pop, I'm going to go into Filter, Sharpen, and on sharp mask. Whenever I sharpen an image, I'll sharpen an image anywhere from oh, about 100% to 200, 220%. And you can see here, this is with the preview on. That's with the preview off. It looks a little bit more muted with the preview off. And I like that amount of sharpening right there. I don't know if you can see this on the screen here or not, but right up in here, I've got some very detailed imaging going on. I'll hit OK with that. And sometimes I'll go in here and I'll play with the uh, hue and saturation a little bit. And I'd like to point out that what I was talking about earlier in the studio, as a consequence of shooting in that black box with the underlit uh, tissue paper, newspaper, plastic bags, and so on and so forth with the LED lights, I end up getting something that is quite colorful. Maybe a little bit too saturated for my liking. So let's move it back a little bit. And there we go. I've moved, actually backed off of the saturation a little bit. And it looks great. Okay. And I think now I'm ready to look at different rotations on this image. See what it looks like when rotated clockwise. No, I don't like that as well. How about uh, going horizontal? Going a horizontal rotation. Oh, there we have it. Kind of looks like something with two eyeballs up here and a beak and uh, two red feet down here. So I might crop that just a little bit. There we go. And right there we have my final image. So this is one that I like. And uh, go up here into history and this is where we started out at. That's where we started out, a little bit underexposed, a little soft, and with a little sharpening and judicious use of some of the slaughter controls, I ended up with something that looks like this. Now when I close this back out, it's going to ask me if I want to save it. I select yes to save, and it will save that image back to Lightroom. And when I go back into Lightroom, In just a minute here, Lightroom is now importing that photo. It will show up as the original image, then as the new image on top of it. And if I want to save that, of course, then I could go and export it and uh, pump it on out to the web. So that's basically what I do when I'm editing my photographs and I'm doing my post-processing. There's not a real lot involved, just a little bit of uh, light tweaking to make the uh, image really pop when it's uh, presented. Finally, before we conclude today's presentation, I would like to remind everybody that I do have a book out there called Today Photographic Art, a compilation of ICM images, and it gives examples of many, many of the things that we have covered here today. You can purchase that book on Amazon or you can find it on my website at ddayicmart.com. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for participating in today's event, and especially I would like to thank Dave Newman for hosting this event. Dave, I really appreciate the opportunity here today to present this material. Thanks, everybody, and have a good day, and continue making some great photographs.